My name is Denise Kavish. I'm here to introduce Jody Owens. He is a Potter's Guild member and he'll be doing a demo on his way of applying illustrations to his pottery. Well, what I'm doing today is a variation of my Drink Me mugs, which is a project that kind of came from a whole series of Alice in Wonderland designed ideas. So what we're doing right now, I've got this mug here that's bisqueware, ready to glaze. And to get it started, I've got to do the inside of the mug with the black so that the designs will reach in and out of it. But the glaze needs to go first because the last thing in the world you want to do is do all the decoration on the outside, pour the inside glaze, and then pour glaze all over your decorations, which will be just a giant, giant mess. I've got my black glaze here. It's well stirred, but just to make sure that no weird lumps end up in my glaze, I'm going to run it through the sieve just, just enough to make sure, yeah, there's a couple in there, so that won't end up in my pot. So we're just going to pour in the glaze. I don't have enough here to quite fill it up, but that's okay, because by just turning the, the mug around, we can get right up to where I need to be. And it's okay if it goes a little bit over, because we're gonna clean that up here. A nice wet sponge ready, because we're just gonna wash off the edge. And when I made the pot, I actually pinched a small bevel on the edge so that uh, it would be really easy to clean up because by using the wet sponge, you can just follow that edge and get a nice, clean, finished division between the black and what will be the underglaze painting in the end. And we just go over a little bit as we go and just use the, use the actual bevel as a guide so that we're just taking the excess glaze off where we don't want it. It's a good technique for any time that you want to divide glazes and whatnot. I mean, I could wax resist this if I wanted, but I don't really need that to separate the two glazes when I do the clear glaze in the end. But yeah, so right now we've got a nice clean red. So now that we've done that, we're ready to do the underglaze decoration. Now, in order to get this kind of a design on here, I need to at least draw my design in first just so that we get a good layout to follow because I am not one who does well with just kind of letting things happen as they happen. So, which is part of the reason why I use the underglazes in the first place because they give me a lot more control over the decoration that you can't get in most cases when it comes to using traditional glazing methods as far as this kind of uh, particular uh, decoration process. Now, the first thing, because the design bisects the pot, we want one side that's going to be clear and then the color is going to be on the other and the words drink me are going to be written down. So the first thing I need to do is actually, um, is find a, eh, roughly the center point of both. So I have a start and end point. So I know where I'm going with all the lettering. So it may not be perfect, but if it's close enough, that's good. But I just need to be able to see where I'm going here. And, right. well, now that I've got my little guidelines on here, I can hand write in the lettering that I want. And I tend to do everything on this square because I like to draw my designs on so I know exactly what I'm going to be doing before I do it because um, you can't do that on greenware in the same way because otherwise, not at least not without scoring or potentially damaging the clay surface. And that I'm just not on board with. Okay, so I'm going to draw the design on, the lettering on a guideline anyway, out of pencil. I do that by hand on bisqueware specifically so that I can draw it out I can erase it if I need to, if something doesn't look right, and I don't have to worry about making mistakes in the same way because the graphite completely burns out in the process of firing. So if I put a smudge of, if I smudge it, it just doesn't matter. So, and we're aiming the lettering in this case so that the tops of letters are gonna be in the clear space because it'll actually read better that way. So we're going to flip the other side, and I've got my marks over here too. And we're going to do exactly the same thing. 
the nice part about doing lettering is that you don't have to get too fanatic about it. You don't have to draw out all the thickness of the lines or whatnot. You just need to have the guides on there because the other stuff will happen when you actually paint the when I actually paint the lines in. All right, we've got lettering on both sides. We're ready to start painting. The, the nice part about the way I do my the decoration is I, I layer a lot. I use the generally Amico underglazes. I'm familiar with the product. They've got a good line of colors and they flow well. Uh, they mix well and I know what I'm going to get when I'm working with them. So right now the plan is, like we've got the Drink Me Mug here in yellow, but this version is going to be a red one. So uh, the way the underglazes work when you layer them, if you go dark to light, the, the pigments and the darker colors tend to be strong enough that they will come through and influence the color that's on top. So in that process, like right here, I'm painting this black on the handle, but it won't stay black in the final piece because by the time I get the other color layered on top of it, the color will change. And I'm doing the side of the color here first because my final step is going to be putting the lettering on and that's going to clean up any irregularities I get when I do the painting or the color field on the side. So right now I'm just getting the black on here and I think I'm even going to switch brushes so I get more surface area going here. And I do tend to use a little bit of water on my brushes because I like to have a little better flow than that. So, but that does sometimes mean I need to have more than one coat for sure, especially on the black. Blacks tend not to need that whole three coats thing that you're always hearing about because they tend to be well saturated. And I don't need three coats on the bottom color on this. I'll need three coats overall, but not for this portion itself. So this way I can use this brush to get the big areas, which is just a traditional wide flat brush. Once I get the big areas of the black, then I can go back with the smaller brush and get some of these edges that I want. I'm also going to do some other little things too. So rather than just have a completely flat color. I'm going to add some color in, but then I'm also going to sponge it off so that it's more of a watercolor effect. And that's a nice way to just to get a little more of a watercolor effect on the final product. So there's just just more visual interest. So what I'm doing here is just adding black around the bottom here because as, as if the black is kind of bleeding out, so to speak, from the handle. Because what will happen is when I paint the red over the top of it, all of this black is going to turn into more or less a burgundy color. So once I get enough in there to kind of get me started with, and that's working pretty good, I'm going to take a damp sponge, fairly damp, and we're actually going to blot it so it smooth softens and actually spreads that black out. It doesn't look like a bunch of big brush strokes going on. And I can use that to soften those edges. Because the lettering is the last thing we do. Let me grab my red. We need a couple layers on here. So we're just going to go over everything. And this is usually the part that when I have heavy decorations, like the floral design, the ivy design on that platter, um, you, that was all done in black line work first, and then you have to paint over the whole thing in red after you do it, which is a little unnerving at times, because you're just kind of praying that nothing goes wrong. So, and like I'm showing here, we're just going to paint right over the black with the red. The black will influence through the red in the final product, and it will come out a dark burgundy color, like I said. And this technique works for at least my illustration style. Because my background is in illustration and graphic design, which I happen to really enjoy the whole process of 
combining a, what should be a two-dimensional art form and then introducing it to a three-dimensional art form. Get as close to the lettering where we have to be more precise as we can. And the big thing about making sure you have enough coats really is going to be about not being able to see the clay body underneath. And the final coat to actually look solid. We also, because of the way this design is going to wrap around, I do need to paint in, following along that lip, between the pencil marks that I made, which were the guidelines for the lettering. The nice part is you generally don't have to be absolutely perfect because if you have a little bit of overlap into the glaze area, it generally doesn't matter in most cases. Um, you, it can be a little forgiving because the black glaze on the inside is actually hides a lot. So the black glaze will be what really shows. Sometimes the trick is holding this and getting your work done without obliterating your pencil lines. What we do here is we're going to paint in on the bottom edges of the lettering so that they'll reach out from the field of color in the final piece. And again, this technique, you don't have to be absolutely perfect as long as you, you know, you get in close to the line, you're going to be okay because the final step is going to correct small bits of things that we don't want. Like right here, I got a little bit of a red smudge in the end, but that's not going to matter because in the end, we're going to paint over that. And as you'll see later, the black line work will fix a lot. Because a lot of times I see people spending way too much time trying to get, doing this kind of design, but then spending way too much time trying to butt all their colors up against each other instead of using kind of the old... Uh, trick that gets done in silk screening, t-shirt design and whatnot, where all the colors are laid out and then a final outline color is laid on top of it, which then covers all the little out of registration marks. And that's essentially what we're doing here. It does give a little bit of a comic book look for some things, but that's okay because I love comic books. So that works on that side. I know it doesn't look like much at the moment, but the final design will make total sense. And then we do exactly the same thing over here, Get close to those pencil lines, but you know, they're not absolute unless you're doing a really fanatically detailed exacting. That gets the basis of what we need for the lettering. We can go back over this because we do need to make sure we've got a good solid red on here. Otherwise, it'll get blotchy and or we'll have bits of the clay body showing through, which will look patchy. Which I'm going to just give a little bit more of the red just to make sure that I've got enough I've got enough saturation on here that the black will come through but it won't look like black. All right, I think we got enough red on there, so I will come back to the black. Line work generally works best if you have a long, narrow brush. And as you can see, as I put in the line work, I'm essentially cleaning up the less desirable edges that we had from the red. Now, if you get something that lands out of where you want it, outside of your boundaries, you just take a pen tool and scratch that off. It's less about using the tip of the brush as it is for this kind of line work as it is about dragging it along the path you want. I often tell people it's like dragging a trailer behind you. 
Okay, so that gets that side. And then we also make sure, or at least I do anyway, of continuing that black line up and over the rim until it touches the glaze on the inside, because that way the design actually reaches out from the inside and wraps around. And then once we get the one side done, repeat the process on the other. And one of the nice things about handmade pots is that small variations and imperfections, the fact that it's not 100% perfectly symmetrical, it's perfectly fine. But I do try to make them as exact as I can. Your dark cobalt electric blues or the chocolate browns, the really deep ones, do a really nice job of trimming out colors. So if you wanted something a little subtler than the black, because obviously the black can be a little strong depending on your, your, your visual preferences. That gets a set and after this, it gets hit with the clear glaze, and this mug is done.